Hello. My name is Trey Shan, and uh, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I used to own the X Ray Cafe. Yeah. And uh, from 1990 to 1994, yeah, I'm not introducing myself here, okay? But I thought that I should introduce myself before I introduce who I'm going to introduce. But between 1990 and 1994, this uh, next uh, duo, group, band, uh, people uh, played my club, and uh, I got to know them kind of periodically through that. Including, I think mostly I had one of the best times uh, with one of them during the uh, International Pop Festival at Olympia in 92. That's when I really felt like I'm really friends with these darn Canadians. And uh, the thing with the Canadians are they're great. The Canadians always have been great. They've, they've, they've been funny, they've been smart, and they get it. They're clever. They really are. They really, really, really are. It's true. So, uh, it just, it, it, it's their 25th anniversary, I mean, 1990, 94, that was only like, you know, what, 13, 15, 19 years ago or something. So they were doing this shit for 10 years before I ever met them. And uh, I just think that's incredible. I, I didn't even really know that until right now. So um, it just gives me, it just warms the cause of my heart and fucking just kicks ass because I love these two people. Uh, please put your hands together and give them a warm policy and welcome. Uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia, Mecca Normal. I had no idea about what it was, <laughs> I want to say anything, but about uh, being in a band. Uh, I'd it was just all something to do, really. have any we didn't have any idea what what was going to happen and it, it makes it sound like something incredible happened well the only incredible thing that happened was we just kept going It was really a reaction to what was going on in the music scene in Vancouver, which we were part of by being regulars at a lot of punk shows. And so women are telling truth about their lives, and sometimes what that truth comes out as is anger. In Mecca Normal's song, I Walk Alone, Jean Smith screams that it should be her right to go anywhere without the fear of being raped or harassed. Because it's my right to walk anywhere at any time of day wearing whatever the fuck I want to. This is my home and I'm not alone. This is my home and I'm not. 
challenges how we are as humans and tries to contribute something in a, in a very positive way. Calling yourself a band and not having the drums and bass is definitely a political thing to do. It's calling into question the whole essence of what a band is and what songwriting is. And again, the way we make records, uh, what re making records uh, is all about. The fact that we don't have synthesizers and we don't have a bunch of drum t tracks. We try to go with the raw passion that's there. Graphic designers by trade, Gene and David formed Mecha Normal in 1985 and have released six critically acclaimed albums since. Now the duo has collaborated on a book. Gene is the writer and David is the publisher. I Can Hear Me Fine examines Gene's feminist and political concerns. Here's an excerpt. My thoughts are chased by dogs, trapped in instamatic snapshots. Their eyes are red in the night. I can see into their mouths, past the teeth, past the teeth. I'm at home in the strangest places, but the sea is just pounding water, trying to get revenge, trying to get revenge. The book is, uh, I, I was going to say about, but it's not really a book that has an about it's not dogmatic, it's not saying this is good, this is bad. I think it's very easy to uh, imitate what we already know. The band finally started to make money this year, but communication is more important than conventional commercialism. Although Mechanormal is relatively unknown in Canada, they are internationally respected. Their lengthy live shows are passionately political, and they tour Europe for the third time this spring. It's not strange to me, but I realize it is for other people. So uh, for Jean and I, we've been doing this for so many years that it's just, this is normal, the way she sings, the way I play guitar, what we do together. And, it, and it's always a shock if other people think, that's weird. Because, you know, this is our life, this is normal. Don't do this to be mysterious or quirky or odd or to, you know, get attention because we're different or something. It's not a gimmick. In addition to the three series that I've introduced, No Coal, Raven Coal Mine, and The Nine Symptoms of Narcissism, I also, kind of in the last minute, being inspired by David Lester's uh, piece called uh, Free Pussy Riot, I did uh, a, a series uh, called Pussy Riot. These were paintings uh, that we were taking out on tour uh, and putting up usually just for one day in the same space that we performed in as Mecca Normal. Uh, so it was, uh, this particular tour was called the Black Dot Museum of Political Art and uh, that included the Pussy Riot pieces of which there were maybe seven and the No Coal and Raven Coal Mine series and Dave's great series called The Inspired Agitators which really inspired my sense of, of creating uh, political artwork 
And here at this point, we fast forward to February of this year when I did a portrait. It is actually of Dave's wife, Wendy, but I didn't really feel it was entirely flattering. In fact, really not at all. And uh, so I was in, it was in kind of deep. But the, the thing that happened was, it was the beginning point for all of the subsequent 170 paintings I've done since that point. Uh, I had no idea that there was any market or interest in portraits of nobody, essentially, or uh, amalgamations of uh, features uh, from various sources. I, I'm painting from photographs, but it really doesn't matter who it is. It's more about the paint, the intensity, the emotions that that come through. So uh, this has now turned into what I'm doing full time after after quitting my uh, short-lived stint at Home Hardware Garden Center where they had me lugging water around uh, in the spring and then they wanted me to come in this was supposed to be a part-time job they wanted me to come in uh, seven days in a row for four hours each at five in the morning uh, so right at this juncture I was I was having some success. These paintings were selling. I was selling enough to make a living. I've got fairly low overhead and I was making enough to pay my bills in, in selling this series which is $100 US for uh, 11 by 14 and uh, I was selling 8 or 9 sometimes up to 12 I think I sold in August so part of the the political action here is is simply being able to uh quit working, become self-employed through doing a series of uh evocative, I hope compelling faces, portraits. Uh, I've extended the series in a few different directions. It started with the hat, and then I started doing, after a few variations of hats, I started doing no hat, and uh, and and it, uh, sales weren't affected. I, it's been a nerve-wracking time, you know, when you hit on something that actually seems to be working. It's it's kind of terrifying, you know, success. It can go wrong in so many ways uh, and that's been really interesting because a lot of the things we've done as mecha normal uh, have been pretty low-key we we didn't set out to be famous but we have maintained this great creative partnership David Lester and I where we're we've been making music together for over 30 years having made 13 albums and toured a lot enough. <laughs> I'm sure there's more to do. But it, it was never an intention to become fa famous or make a bunch of money. We we actually set out to change the world. That was that was why Mecca Normal was created. We wanted to address young women specifically and and encourage them to start bands with their friends, women girls, their female friends, and start addressing what was going on for them in culture, popular culture in their scene. Because at that time, in the 80s, there was really, uh, there weren't many women in bands on stage, and if they were, they were typically the bass player, and the words were not about feminism or sexism. So we started Mecha Normal specifically to change that and the the result was that we did to some extent we did change the world and we do a classroom event called how art and music can change the world that 
illuminates a lot of uh, why people make political art, what their intentions are, what ours are specifically, and how Riot Girl came to exist in Olympia, Washington, uh, and that we were uh, an inspiration to the co-founders of Riot Girl. Uh, so we we were uh, influential to that development, and that was that has always been something I've kind of wanted to make known that it is that it is possible to have an idea and for things to happen from that. There's there's just such an overwhelming sense that you can't do anything, and this is not the case. We have the evidence. So uh, at a certain point when things were going really well, you're seeing some of Dan's, the ones that Dan has up there. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. So I, I thought, well, he was actually the only person as far as a retail situation or a gallery that I wanted to contact because because of his sort of uh, sensibility uh, around art and and the the store that he has in Hudson, New York where we've played and we've met up with Dan on many occasions to to work together primarily in music with Bunny Brains and Mecha Normal sharing the bill yet again on on a number of occasions uh, so I I wanted to send paintings out to the store for him to include in uh, his collection there and now they're in Portland which is fantastic I wish I was in Portland to be participating uh, I, I did get a laptop laid on me last night that should enable me to be Skyping I, I don't know if I can get that together so I wanted to make this specifically uh, for you and to just sort of uh, fill out from from beginning to end uh, what's what is a, a lifetime of making political art and uh, and regarding that intention as as a viable life the the, the benefits from having a a creative partnership where where you have accountability and support and encouragement is is really a hell of a life to put together with one or two friends who who maybe don't have the same skills that that you do but uh in in fact David and I are are very different people he's uh not my romantic partner it's a creative partnership all these years that we have work together on uh, book projects, writing, publishing, uh, and mostly Mecha Normal, the music, but uh, he's a very fine uh, graphic illustrator, comic uh, illustrator, who is working on a uh, book right now about Emma Goldman, uh, her final years in Toronto. So when that is complete, we will likely put together some sort of adaptation involving all these things, the music, his artwork, and the way that we present information, uh, some kind of adaptation to, to bring it all together, which is, is relatively new and challenging for, for us to, to use the basis of, of Mecha Normal and the music and uh and move outward from there but this is what happens when you when you stick with something uh 30 years or more so the the sense of the paintings uh, evolving through through these uh 6 or 7 months since i have started and and created uh about 170 of them half of them have sold directly off my Facebook page, just my personal page, uh, to people who know me through music, but also some actual world-class art world artists, which has been kind of shocking to get some uh, 
feedback from people who have shown in various, you know, high level uh, shows in major institutions. So that's been a real thrill to to feel like I'm on to something here. And now it's a matter of maintaining life in in a way to uh, you know continue painting a lot and it's kind of a shock you know I, I before I was doing this I was I was working on fine tuning a couple of novels I have one novel out with a literary agent who is submitting it to various publishers that's been an ongoing uh, process for a couple of years now. That's a that's a slow business. Wow, getting anything published, but this is all a total surprise to be. I, I'm a painter suddenly. I mean, it's not something completely out of the blue. My parents are both painters. I went to art school for a little bit. Uh, couldn't couldn't hack it, man. It was just not for me. They wouldn't give me any black paint. I was supposed to be making black at art school. That was that was it for me. Make your own black. Uh, so I started a punk rock band. Seemed like a fitting response to that. I'll make I'll make my own goddamn black over here on the stage. So I I I had thought at some point that I would be a painter or a, a commercial artist as it was called back back at that point. But uh, yeah, these have been some of the happiest times ever to, to be self-employed, making art that is, is put out in front of people as soon as it's dry. It goes up on Facebook and people seem uh, happy that it's $100. People have been telling me I should put the price up. I don't want to put the price up. I like doing a lot of them and I want to make them available at this lower affordable sort of rate. I don't really want to be in in regular galleries. I mean, I don't know what what is really next overall. Something may happen along those lines, but it, it's not my ambition to be, you know, incorporating sort of a middleman, the gallery into the process. Uh, if I can do it on my own in, in this DIY sensibility, that's, that's my preference. Uh, so that is uh, also, I think, the politics behind doing, doing the art, making the paintings day by day, and and that they are of mainly feminine faces. A lot of them are not gender specific, and many of them are actually uh, done from a photograph of a trans model. And that that's also very kind of uh, interesting to well, interesting is not a good word, but to make faces that are not specifically of women because that that is that is a strange pursuit in and of itself it's this layering of color on on the on a woman's face much like applying makeup or the masks or what what you know the layers that women essentially the barriers between themselves and the the world external to them uh so that has that's all these are all things I'm thinking about while I'm doing it is is it political to be painting a a pretty lady how is that how is that a viable way to to make political art so I I challenge myself with with thinking like that and in fact recently I I've started working on on much larger panels 20 by 24 and I had thought that I would simply be transferring uh, to scale the faces that I'm doing uh, but then I realized that if I made the faces the same size then I would have a lot of extra uh, background which I could infuse with political notions you know I don't want to be having banners or or text or whatever but there they could be faces in scenes that they're bearing witness 
so I, I started working on that, uh, had, had very mixed results. But what, what did happen was, because I've been watching the direct action and the uh, protests at Standing Rock, I, I did a couple of paintings, interpretations. They're fairly abstract. They do have some figures up along the top of the water protectors. And uh, I was very surprised that when I put that up on my Facebook page, it got a really great response. So that that is something that is obviously directly political. It's, it is practically all that it is. It is very related to the title. Uh, Standing Rock Water Protectors, uh, which is something, you know, I've definitely done before in giving things titles that are that are undeniably political and leaving the piece to be more, the piece of art itself to be more ambiguous. Uh, but uh, yeah, the process continues and hopefully I will be able to uh, beam myself into into the space today. Thank you for listening.